Okay, we've got 1.30, so why don't we get started. Good afternoon, Research Methods. Welcome to 11, 12, 13. Isn't that fun? Let's give it up for 11, 12, 13. Yay. All right. All right. That doesn't, ha doesn't happen very often. In fact, that happens exactly once a century, so we should rejoice in this day. Okay, 11, 12, 13. Okay, so let's just remind ourselves of where we are. We're talking on this date, which is November 12th. We're still in Chapter 8. We're dealing with complex designs, and we, we introduced these the other day. We were talking about what complex designs are. Can somebody just remind us what we mean by complex designs? What is a complex? It's a factorial design, and what does that mean? Go ahead, Jenna. We're looking at the interactions between one Okay, we're looking... Yep. We're looking at interactions between multiple independent variables, and Katie's correctly given us that this is also called a factorial design. Okay, so why don't we do this? Uh, frequently, we like to take um, uh, two steps forward, one step back, just to do a little bit of review each day. And I know that uh, creating uh, the correct responses to these issues of whether we have a significant interaction, whether we have significant main effects, takes a little bit of practice. So we're going to continue what we started yesterday, looking at some of the PowerPoint issues where we have examples of factorial designs. The simplest kind of factorial, and let's yell that out. The simplest kind of factorial design is? To, wow, okay, this group showed up. All right, so it looks like we're ready to go. Um, and we'll see that in just a moment. What I thought I'd do is just remind us of the uh, visual search task that we were looking at the other week. We had a visual search where we were trying to find a green circle amidst different kinds of distractors. And uh, there's something like that that comes up even inside of our PowerPoint. I'm going to show you a screen filled with uh, lots of, oh, you can see it here. Uh, you're, you're to yell out here whether we have a unique image or not. Is there a unique target amongst these distractors? What do we think? Okay, and that's a zero, okay, or you can see a zero or an alphabetic O there. And then let's see if you can find whether there's one here or not. You yell out either yes or no. Okay. Le big, big latency, big, big latency. People are shaking their head, no unique character. Actually, there is one right over here, believe it or not. We have a red O. There's only one red O. We have a red O. <laughs> Everybody, everybody's saying, oh, okay. So you can see that sometimes a visual search is ridiculously easy. It's almost offensive, right? And then sometimes not so much, okay? So the idea about this is that the target distractor similarity, the number of distractors, plays a really, really big role. And that just sets up the, the first factorial design that we're going to be talking about. We were talking the other day about different kinds of tasks as one of our variables. And we talked about the different kinds of hemispheres. Can somebody give us the script for describing this two by two? <clears throat> we have a script for describing graphs. Somebody, okay. Yeah, thanks, Meg. <laughs> okay, really good. All right. Good team effort there. We got there. And this graph, mean reaction time, and that's measured in milliseconds, is plotted as a function of set size with response type as the parameter. It's a perfectly reasonable way of describing this factorial or complex graph. It is a two by two. And hopefully you can see that uh, as set size gets bigger, we do see some kind of an increase, at least in some situations, in our reaction time. And as you might remember, reaction time is kind of like golf where lower scores are better. Okay. All right, so let's see if we can uh, take a vote, as we've been doing in recent days. We'll have you vote with your fingers, and one means, yes, there's a significant effect. Two means no significant effect, non-sig. And three means, I don't know what this guy is talking about. Okay, so the first question, and we have several questions that we can ask about this. The first question will be, is there an interaction here? We'll let you take a look at that, and if you think, yes, there is a significant interaction, you can put up one. If you think that the interaction is non-significant, two fingers. If you're not sure, please put up three fingers. We'll let you take a look at this. Okay, and we'll let people vote. It's good to have everybody participating. It's okay if you're not sure, you can put up three. Okay, I think I see largely a bunch of ones, and I think I saw Marin give the f maybe the first one, at least the first one that I saw. So I think one is probably correct. Can you describe for us your reasoning? Uh, because the lines aren't parallel on the graph, so they'll eventually intersect, meaning there is a significant 
Okay, right. So most likely, these two are going to, if they could continue, uh, they would indeed intersect, and we have a, de a strong departure from parallelism. And when we get a departure from parallelism, we have evidence for an interaction. And you might remember that this really is a continuous variable. That is, those can be very, very strongly departing, or they can just be barely departing from parallelism. Right? So here we have pretty clear evidence that that would be a significant interaction. Show of hands, who's okay with that? Okay, and I think Hannah pointed this out the other day. What does this thing mean? What do we, when we have that little indicator there, what are we signifying to our audience? Go ahead, Kip. It's not proportional, but we're being very honest about it. Right? We're, we're conveying to them, hey, don't attempt to pull proportionality out of this. Right? We're, we're not studying with the zero down here. Okay, um, let's see if we can do the main effects. So even in a two by two, we're going to have an interaction, any two by two, we'll have an interaction, we'll have a main effect. Uh, per, that we could evaluate for the x-axis variable, and we'll have a main effect that we can evaluate for the parameterized variable as well. So let's take a look at the set size variable. We'll have you do a little bit of mental gymnastics, and the question on the floor is, do we have a significant effect for set size, a significant main effect for set size? We'll let you think, and we'll let you vote with your fingers. Yes, I think it's significant. No, it's not with two fingers, or three, I'm not sure. And the question is, main effect of set size. We'll let you think about that for a moment. It does take a little bit of time to think this through. And if we're not sure, we can put up three. It's okay. Put up three and, and not be sure. Shouldn't feel bad about that. Uh, this is rehearsal time, right? This is not a test. We, we're like the blue coats. We like to rehearse. So <laughs> that's, that's why we're here. I really appreciate the honest. I see several people putting up threes, and I think that's great. I think I saw Mira with an early one, and I think Mira is correct to put up a one. Can you tell us how you, how you thought about this, Mira? Okay. Right, all right. So if I can just say a little bit more around that, what we're really doing is saying, on average, are we generating different reaction times on the set size of three versus the set size of six? That's the question on the floor. That's really, what we're asking is, is set size generating a difference? And if you can imagine taking the average of those two, are people okay with me averaging those out to maybe you know, 550, 560, something like that? Is it approximately? Okay, is that working for us? And then let's hold that number in our back pocket, 550, 560-ish. And then we take the average of those two guys, and that's going to be something notably higher. Maybe it's 650, maybe it's 640. But you see that there might be a pretty clear difference between that mean of 3 versus the mean that we get here at 6. Who's following that logic? Okay? And to the extent that we feel that those are pretty far apart from each other, then we've got a pretty good chance at saying that there really is a set size effect because 6 is generating longer reaction times than 3 is. Okay? All right, so that's where we are in that. Now, there's one more that we can do out of this. We've already done the interaction. We did the main effect for set size. You tell me what's the last one that we're going to be looking for. Can you yell it out? Okay, we're going we're to look for the main effect for response type. Okay, right, the parameterized variable. So let's put that question on the floor. Is there a main effect for response type? Response type comes in two flavors, no and yes. And if you think there is a significant effect there, you can vote one uh, with one finger, non-significant two fingers. Three is I'm not sure how to do this. I'll let you think it through. These do take a little bit of practice. And I think among the first that I saw was Jenna, and then we'll come back to Maddie, I think. Can, can you help us out, Jenna? Um, so if you combine like terms, so combine the no response, and then combine the yes. Okay. So average those two out, the no's are going to be higher than the yes's. Perfect. Okay, if I were a little bit taller, I'd reach, but now I'll try to do it with my cursor. So we want to combine like terms as always here. Because we're looking at the main effect of response type, the like terms would be the no responses versus the yes responses. The no responses are going to have a mean halfway between these two no points, right? So it's going to have a mean right about here. That might be just shy of 700 versus a mean down here for the yes. It's going to be noticeably shy of 600. So we have about a 100 millisecond difference in those means. We'd have to actually run the test to be sure, but that's most likely the case. Maddie also was signifying with a one. Was that what you were going to, to do? OK. And I think Katie has a question. How did you get the, how did you figure out effect size for, effect, main effect for set size 
For set size, okay, let's do both of those so they're, they're contrasted with each other. Okay, so for set size, we did the, the average of these two versus the average of these two. And the reason we did that was because we're basically comparing th the three effect versus the six effect, if you will. Okay? Or the, the three level versus the six level. And then we can regroup these a different way. Uh, now the second question that we had asked was about, is there an effect for response type? And now this is no versus yes, so we'll take the no family, right? And here's the no family. We'll take their mean, and then we'll compare that to the yes family. We'll take their mean, and that's how we're making that comparison. Did that work for us? Okay. All right. Really good. These are a little bit tricky, uh, and so we practice them. And these are rehearsal sessions that we're doing. Okay. Um, why don't we get a little bit more practice, and then we'll move on to other ideas beyond this. So same kind of arrangement in this graph. Mean reaction time is plotted as a function of set size with response type as parameter. But here, we have just a slightly different data set. Okay? But it's the same set of variables. Same two by two. Okay? Let's go through our sequence one more time with this new data set. Is there an interaction here? We'll let you take a look at the information on the screen visually. We'll let you perform your mental gymnastics. And please vote uh, one if you think it's significant in the interaction, two for a non-significant interaction, and three, I don't know what this guy's talking about. And now, Everybody in the room, I think, is, well, almost everybody's voting. Good, everybody's voting and everybody's giving two. This is non-significant because, yell it out, they're parallel. They're, ri they're ridiculously parallel, okay? <laughs> okay? All right, so you couldn't get less evidence for an uh, interaction than that. Okay, same picture. We're now going to pull out a different piece of information, right? So we're keeping the retinal stimulation the same, but we're going to operate on that retinal stimulus differently. Is there a main effect for set size? We'll let you think this through. And again, if you think there's a significant effect for set size, one finger. If you think the set size effect is non-significant, two fingers. Three, if we don't know what's going on. Okay, uh, Kip has voted a couple of times. I, number one is what you're putting up. Let's see, can you walk us through what you've got there? Yeah, uh, so you would like, average out the, uh, the dots in each set size. Okay. So three would okay. Okay. Probably you would wind up with a significant effect. And that was a little bit closer, but I, I think you'd get there. And, and specifically, the set size of three would be lower than the set size of six. Who's okay with that? Okay, one more, you tell me, which is the remaining uh, main effect that we have to pull out? It's the main effect of response type. Okay, so we'll let you think that through. We'll let you do your mental gymnastics and report by either one, two, or three fingers whether we think we have a significant effect of response type. Okay, most of us are there. Some of us are still thinking it through. Okay, Hannah's putting up one finger. Do you want to walk us through? I think that's probably about right. Um, the average or the no responses, well, if they're parallel, it will always be higher. Oh, actually, it's not about parallelism. Um, okay. okay. Well, yeah, but it's higher, but... Um, okay, so, so these two are going to average out. Uh, the ones up top, the no's, will have a higher mean than will be the case for the yeses. Okay. All right, really good. Now, um, there are some questions to be had there, right? It could be the case that you have parallel lines, but they're, um, uh, they're so steeply sloped. Right? If they're parallel, there's going to be no evidence for an interaction. But sometimes you might think about the variability that you would get. You could take the average of those two and the average of these two, and there's not a lot of variability there. But if they were wildly different numbers, really low, really high, and you take the average of that and you put it in the context of the standard deviation, you've got a mean with a really, really fat standard deviation on it. If you have a narrow, a shallower slope, like what we're seeing here, you'll still have the mean, but <clears throat> the numbers won't be that different from each other, and you'd have a smaller standard deviation. So not to confuse us too much, that was the correct uh, reasoning. It had to do with no having a higher mean than yes. Who sees the difference between the no and the yes means? Okay. All right. Really good. Really good. Okay. Let's go just a little bit further, and um, let's see if we can have somebody answer this or yell it out. Please, what is the dimensionality of this study? What is the dimensionality of the study? Remember that a piece of lumber can be a two by four. Go ahead, Natalie. Three by two. A three by two, or equivalently, a two by three, okay, right? And so, in this graph, mean trait ratings, whatever that means, is plotted as a function of social role with gender as a parameter, okay? What's really great about that script is you become really good 
readers of graphs, even if you don't know what the variables are. So you could go over and look at a very, very complicated graph coming from physics or astronomy or chemistry. And even if you didn't know what the chemical names were, you'd have a really good feel for what's being measured, what might be driving differences in those measurements, the, the different uh, independent variables. Okay? So here, mean trait ratings are plotted as a function of social role with gender as the parameter. Okay, let's think about this for a moment, and let's go with our one, two, and three. Is there an interaction here? If we think so, we'll put uh, up one finger. If we think not, we'll put up two. And if we're not sure what to do here, we'll vote with three. Okay. And KDB had a, a quick and, I think, correct response. So you've got one finger, so you think there's an interaction. And can you describe for us where you think that is? Um, uh, I think Okay, yeah, okay, so yeah, here they're parallel. So right on top of each other, they're parallel, but here we get a strong departure from parallelism, and all we really need is one departure from parallelism, and that does the trick for us. So there probably is an interaction going on here, okay? All right, so we're, we're getting good at finding these things. We won't go through all of the, um, uh, all the variations on the, the main effects in that last one. Okay, so that was our first trick for discerning this new and fairly difficult concept of the interaction. Uh, we spend a lot of time in our curriculum here at, at Denison Psychology Department dealing with interactions. So if you take uh, more courses, you will see the idea of an interaction in a lot of the literature that, that you read. So we try to give you a couple of tricks for seeing these interactions, including looking for parallel lines. That was our first trick. There's another trick that we have that's a little bit more difficult. It works well if you have some graphical information, actually some, some tabular information. Uh, and this is called the subtraction method. So what I'd like to do now is we didn't do this one yesterday. We'll give you a moment to just read through your notes and then what I'll do is I'll call on somebody and see if they can take us through the subtraction method. Okay, so this was in the video from uh, the other day and we'll let you think it through and then we'll see if somebody can walk us through the subtraction method. In fact, if you want, you can actually take these few minutes to look at slides number, we are now at number 25. You can go from 25 through, mm, we'll go up to the three-way. How about 25 through 29? Or 25 through 28? We'll do it that way. Okay. So take a moment, read through your notes, and then we'll see if one of you can walk us through. Call up my random number generator. Just warming it up. <laughs> and we'll let you go through and just remind yourselves of 25, 26, 27, 28. Hopefully that refreshed your memory just a little bit from what you might have had in the notes or reminded you of something that you might have seen in the video. So why don't we go ahead, I'll hold down the F9 key. We'll see if somebody can just stop me by yelling out stop. Okay, there's their stop. And Madison, okay, you're a lucky winner, okay? Do you want to begin, and it's okay if you don't go too far, but do you want to just start us on this conversation of the second trick, which is called the, um, let me go back here, which is all about subtraction. Do you want to help us out with that? And if you need to advance us to the next slide, that's okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Madison. Isn't it with the, I think it's the next slide, with the graph, not with the graph, with the boxes and you subtract the numbers that are in the rows? Okay, let's do that. Okay, so you're going to subtract the numbers that are in the rows. Can you walk us through? So here we are. Yeah, so you subtract 3.5 times 
3.34 minus 3.34. And we get zero. zero. Okay, so our first difference in the subtraction method is to subtract. Uh, we'll, we'll take a row in this particular case. If you will, 3-ish minus 3-ish, we'll, we'll keep it at that, equals zero-ish. Okay, so we've got zero as one of our differences. Would you like to keep on going, Madison? Sure. Okay. And then you do the second row. Okay. Can we call it 5-ish? 5-ish minus 1-ish gives us 4-ish, okay? So our first difference, can we all yell it out? Our first difference was, our second difference is 4-ish, okay, right? So we have different differences. What do we do with those when we have different differences? What does that tell us? There is an interaction, okay? So to the extent that we have different differences, we have evidence for an interaction. That was excellent. Thank you, Madison. Thanks for walking us through, okay? Another way of thinking about this is if you plotted those two, they'd be at one height. We'll call that three-ish. If you plotted these two, one would be fairly high, one would be fairly low. We'd have this going on for one of our bars, and we'd have that going on, and we'd clearly have crisscrossing lines, okay? So it's another way of doing it, but it's really a different way of saying the same thing. The subtraction method and our plotting method, our graphical method, would converge, and they would, they would give us the same kind of information, okay? All right. Can we just do this just so you can see that this could have worked. Uh, Madison very legitimately went across the rows, and that's a fine way to do it. You could have picked columns, okay? You can do it that way also. I'll just share with you a couple of common mistakes. Let's go through the columns, and, and then we'll, we'll see what kinds of mistakes we might make. If we start on the top and we subtract the bottom, stay with me. 3-ish minus 5-ish equals negative 2-ish. Hang on to that number. Negative 2 is what we'll put into our, our memory. 3 ish minus 1 ish equals positive 2 ish. So we have negative 2 ish, positive 2 ish. Those are different. By the way, there's a separation there of four units from negative 2 to positive 2. Who's okay with that? When we did it the other way, we had a separation between 0 and 4. Again, there's a, a four unit separation. So it wouldn't matter which way you had done that. Okay? One more thing, and hang on, Natalie, come right back to that. What some people do is this 3 minus 5 is negative 2. And 1 minus 3 is negative 2, so negative 2 and negative 2, everything's similar there. What did I do wrong? That was it, Marm Realad? Okay, so uh, I went here to here first and then here to there a second. It doesn't matter which way you go as long as you pick a direction and stick with it. You can go top to bottom, but if you do, then the next one has to be top to bottom also. You can go bottom to top, but then you have to go bottom to top over here. It doesn't matter which direction you initially pick, but pick that direction and stick with it. Otherwise, you might wind up fooling yourself into thinking that there is an uh, interaction when there isn't there, or you might wind up with a false positive. Who's following that? Okay? Also, you don't want to do this. This is not likely to be done, but you wouldn't go this versus that, and then this versus that. Okay? We either do columns or we do rows, and within that category, we, we pick a direction and we stick with it. Okay? All right. All right. Go ahead and do one more, if that's okay. So this is the same kind of an idea, right? We still have a table, and it's actually the same variables. Here we have task difficulty, which is described categorically. We've operationally defined this task difficulty variable. And remember, the task difficulty really is something out there in the real world, right? And we can operationalize it different ways, easy versus hard. So this would be a categorical designation. And then we also have anxiety level. That could have been continuous, but we're choosing to dichotomize that. We're choosing to make it categorical. We're calling it low versus high. Okay? All right. So we'll let you think through this. You can use the subtraction method, if you will. And after you've used the subtraction method on this to answer the question about whether there's an interaction, can you please vote with your fingers? If you think there's a significant interaction, we'll say one. If you think it's a non-significant interaction, we'll say two. And if you're not sure, we'll go with three. We'll let you do that and vote with your fingers. Okay, lots of folks have two, and I, I see Sasha. Sasha, could you walk us through? That's, you're correct by saying two, so you have that right. How did you think that through? Okay. Okay. Real good, real good. So if you did this way, you do six, six minus four gives you two, and then three minus one gives you two. If you went that way, six minus three gives you three, four minus one gives you three. You always wind up with... Uh, with very similar, in fact, in this case, absolutely identical differences. And so we would wind up with a non-significant interaction between those two. Who's following that? Okay. All right, so now we have a couple of tricks in our back pocket, although I think I see a, a wince on somebody's face in the back. Brittany, are we okay? Did that, did, did that work? I'm happy to do that again. All right, that works? All right. All right. If we were to plot these, we'd see some parallelism 
In fact, as we go from easy to hard, we get a decline of what appears to be three units. Those are going to be perfectly parallel to each other. Okay? All right. All right, questions so far on anything that we've described on this new topic of interactions. Right? This week we're doing complex designs. Once we have more than one independent variable, they can start interacting with each other. How do we know whether they're interacting? Now we have a couple of techniques. We can look for departures from parallelism. We can use the subtraction method. Okay. Mira's got a question. Um, on the slide that had the interaction, that showed an interaction, it asked what the interaction was, and then it said the main effects. Ah, back over here? Ah, we want to do main effects. Okay. Would you like to do those? I'm happy to... I don't know. <laughs> okay. How would we do those? Yeah. Any ideas how we would do those? G great question. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. L let's, let's see if we can do... So actually, these are the, this is basically the same prompt that we've had, but now I've done it in a tabular form rather than in a uh, graphical form. But uh, maybe Meg's got an idea about how we, we could proceed. Or, or you have a different question? No. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, so I really like that. Let's say, so if we were to do the main effects, that was a beautiful setup, Meg, really good conceptualization. So basically we're asking, on average, is there a difference between performance in the easy condition versus in the quote-unquote hard condition? Okay, that's really the question that's on the floor if we're looking at the main effect of task difficulty. Who's understanding that conceptually before we do any numbers on that? So how are we doing on this side versus that side? That's how the task difficulty is divided. And that happens to be easy versus hard. That's the question, okay? All right, anybody want to vote on that? Well, why don't we take a vote on that? Why don't we take a vote on the task difficulty effect? Is there a significant effect of task difficulty in this table? If you think so, please put up one finger. If you think not, please put up two fingers. If you're not sure how this works, put up three fingers. And any of those are fine. We'll let you think about it. I see lots of folks, uh, a couple of folks honestly saying three. Thank you very much. Catherine is putting up a one, I, th I think, and you're correct for putting up a one. Okay, can you tell us how you thought that through, Catherine? Um, I'm not positive if it's okay. this way, but I pictured myself putting it on a graph. Okay. So I went from three to five, and then the other one went from three to one, so it would be intersecting. Okay, uh, so intersection is uh, important if we're looking at... Uh, if we're looking at interactions, but we wouldn't want to use those for, for that. Uh, can we go with Jenna and then with Sasha? Okay. Okay, I, th I think I follow, although I'm hearing some negatives. Um, so did you subtract, is that how you got that? You, you sub yeah. Okay, so you subtracted this one and that one. Uh, okay, I'm not sure I would have gone that way, but maybe that works also. Uh, we'll go with Sasha and then with Katie B. Okay. 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 Four versus two on average, does that work for us? So if we're, if we're back to using main effects, we might engage in averaging, okay? Uh, I'd have to think through, Jenna's algorithm might have generated the same kind of outcome. I'd have to think that through. One idea is you can take the average and you have four versus two, so we're generating more of whatever's being measured here in the easy condition than in the hard condition. Who's following that? Another idea is just stack them up. Five and three is eight-ish. One and three is four-ish, okay? So we're at eight versus four, or if you take the average, four versus two, okay? So we probably do have a main effect of task difficulty with easy generating higher scores than hard in this case, okay? okay so thank you for that question here because it, it helps us make sure that we can see the same kind of process in a different visual construct. And to, to just to complete the idea that Mira has started for all of us, which I think is an important idea, can I ask you to think through the main effect of anxiety level? We've already done the interactions, and because of Mira's excellent question, we've all also now taken a look at the task difficulty main effect. The last component is, is there a main effect for anxiety level? Okay. If you think so, please put up one finger to indicate it's significant, two fingers non-significant, three fingers, I'm not sure how to do this. Okay, I think I see all possibilities. 
Uh, I wonder if I can go back to Catherine. Can we try that? Okay, thank you, Ken. So I added up the high for anxiety level and got around six-ish, and then added up the low for anxiety level and got around six-ish as well, so they're the same. They're the same. So on average, we could say, by combination, we're generating six and six. On average, we're generating three and three, and three is not very different from three. So we're probably not getting a main effect for anxiety level. Who's following that? Okay, that worked for us? Okay. Uh, if you want, I'm happy to go on and do, th these take, we spend some time on this every semester. So you might feel like we're really making our way slowly through these, but it's, it's really good practice. Here's another one that we haven't done for main effects. Shall we do those, or do you think that we've got main effects down? I'm happy to spend a moment on it. Um, I'd like you to determine. Should we go through main effects here, just so we're clear on it, or people think they've got it? How people think they've got main effects, they can figure those out here? How people are not so sure they've got main effects? Okay, several hands went up. Why don't we just take a moment, okay? Because we're going to move on to other material, and we want to get this relatively strongly. So we did the interactions a moment ago, and for the interactions, just to remind you, we did the subtraction method. We did 6 minus 4, we got 2. 3 minus 1, we got 2. No evidence for an interaction. Who's okay with that? Okay, we already did that much. Okay, now the corresponding questions would pertain to the main effects. These are complex designs, even if it's only a 2 by 2. A lot cooking here. Uh, because of this. So let's take this vertical one again. This is the task difficulty. And the question on the floor, is there a main effect for task difficulty? We'll let you do your mental gymnastics, and we'll let you vote. If you think there's a significant effect for task difficulty, please put up one finger. If you think task difficulty is non-significant, put up two fingers. And three, four, we're not sure. Okay. Uh, most of us are there. Most of us are voting. Okay, there is a little bit of divergence in the room, so I'm glad that we've done this, and some folks aren't voting yet. Uh, Nina has a one-up, and I think Nina's correct. Nina, can I, how did you think about this one? Um, well, for task difficulty, just add it to the same. So 6 plus 4 is... 6 plus 4 got you to 10, and then you compared the 10 to... 3 plus 1, so you compared 10 to 4, and those are different from each other. So we probably are generating a significant main effect of task difficulty. That's exactly right. Thank you, Nina. Okay. One more. Our remaining main effect is going to be the main effect of anxiety level. We'll let you perform your mental gymnastics on this. Is there a significant effect for anxiety level? If yes, please vote 1. If not, please vote 2. If you're not sure, please vote 3. Okay. And KDM's voting on this one. And I think, uh, go ahead. How did you think this through? Yeah. Okay. And nine and five are probably different enough from each other, so we probably have a significant main effect there. Okay. All right. All right. Please. Um, I have a question. What determines like a significant effect? How big does the difference have to be, right? Okay. So just a moment ago, Katie M correctly gave us nine versus five. Okay. If we did that that difference, so there's a difference. Of how how big would it have to be? Okay. Here's a question that Catherine is asking us, and it's an excellent question. Here's 9, here's 5, roughly, okay, we'll call that 5, we'll call that 9. Is that a significant difference? How do people think there isn't enough information there to know whether there's a significant difference? Okay, what would we need to add to this to figure out whether that's a significant difference? Anybody have an idea about this? That 9 is a mean, that 5 is a mean, we have some means. Have you thought about anything beyond means this semester? Go ahead, Miriam. We need some error bars. Let's just say we had 9 and 5, and the error bars look like that. <laughs> okay? Those are probably different from each other. Let's say that we have 9 and 5, and the error bars look like this. That's a big denominator in our T-statistic, a big denominator in our ANOVA. Um, here's our numerator. Here's our huge denominator. That's probably going to give us an F-statistic that's really, really small. Okay? So we don't really know for sure is one answer to your question. But if we have a zero, or if, if for example, that's nine and that's nine, we've got no chance. Okay, right? okay. If we have some difference that's visible, well, it might be significant depending on how fat the error bars are. Okay? So this is a way of crudely estimating whether we've got a shot at significance here. And people have done really well with that. Who's following that? Okay? People, how many people also followed the example about the really tiny error bars versus the big, big, fat error bars? Is that working for us? Okay? Yeah. All right, all right. So we're doing really well on these two by twos, okay? And just when we thought we were doing well on the two by twos, here comes a, a three way analysis, okay? Can somebody remind us what we mean when we say we have a three way analysis? What does that imply? Three what? 
three independent variables, okay? So earlier on, maybe even last week, we talked about doing a one-way uh, one ANOVA. And when you're talking about a one-way ANOVA, you can do it either within subjects or between subjects, but one-way implies that you have one independent variable. This week, we've introduced complex designs, and I, th I think it was Jenna who told us that in complex designs, we can see how variables are interacting. And we began that story as simply as we could by having two variables, and we had just two levels of each of those. We did two by twos, okay? Now we're going to take it up just one notch, and this is as complex as we'll get, and we'll keep this one as simple as we can, but as a two by two by two, we have three variables now, three independent variables. Now, of course, the real world contains far more than three independent variables, but we're just going to get a feel for now uh, some of the complexity that arises here, okay? So first, who's okay with that? We're moving on to a three-way, and that means we have three independent variables, yeah, okay? So even more complicated, but it still satisfies our definition of a factorial design because we have two or more independent variables. Okay, let's see what we get into here, all right? And I'll just begin to describe this for us. I'll take one of these graphs at a time. In the left graph, we have mean hiring rate plotted as a function of the applicant's weight with the applicant's gender as the parameter. And we have that same script for the item on the right. But what distinguishes the item on the left from the item on the right is this third variable, which seems to come in two flavors, which is to say it has two levels. It seems to be some kind of body schema variable. There's low body schema on the left, and then on the right we have high body schema. Can anybody re who remembers hearing about the word schema from Intro to Psych? Even if you don't remember what it means, remember hearing this in Intro to Psych? Anybody want to help us with what schema are? Thank you. Okay, right. Yeah, in a, okay, right. So this is very cognitive. We have, we might call these organized bits of knowledge. We have uh, a way of thinking about uh, whatever it is we're thinking about. It's, a, it's an organized set of knowledge, and that might generate some expectations that we have. Okay? Uh, maybe we have ways of thinking about our own bodies. Some people have relatively low body schema. Some people have high body schema. This is independent for, uh, of how your physical body actually is. How do you think about your body? You can imagine having identical twins. Right? They look exactly the same as each other. One sees himself or herself very positively. One sees himself or herself very negatively. So same bodies, same faces, different schema, different organized bits of knowledge about how they, they look and how they perceive themselves. Who's okay with that? At least in understanding what that variable is. Okay? So we've taken some kind of a test and we've divided our participants into who's got low body schema, who's got high body schema, and then within each of those groups we ran a two by two. And we looked at the applicant's weight, and we looked at whether they were male or female, and we looked at their hiring rates. Okay? So that's what's going on here. Okay, is there an interaction <laughs> in this data set, in this two by two by two data set? Is there an interaction? Go ahead, Jenna. Well, in the low body schema participants, it doesn't seem like there is because there's parallel lines. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. So this is now a little bit confusing. So far, in today's conversation, we've been asking you about whether there's been a interaction or not. And we have things like this where we've just had a two by two. And we can look for the parallel lines, or we can do the subtraction method, and we get to a very simple answer. Now it gets a little bit more complicated for the reasons that Jenna just articulated. Here we don't have an interaction, because it's perfectly parallel. Over here, we do have an interaction. And when this occurs, when you get one part, no interaction, one part, yes, interaction. We have evidence for what's called a three-way interaction. Okay, so now we have a significant three-way interaction. And what that means is that the two-way interaction depends on the level of the third variable. This third variable, body schema, comes in low <coughs> and high varieties. And at this level, we don't have an interaction. At this level, we do. So now we have evidence for a three-way interaction. Who's following that? Does that work for us? Okay. So our three independent variables, again, are body schema, and that's giving us the left and right graphs. Applicant weight, that's either normal or overweight. And applicant gender, male or female. Those are gender, weight, and schema are the three independent variables. And there appears to be a three-way interaction going on here because we're getting different two-way interactions. Okay. All right, so let's go just a little bit further. And we'll see, this is not one that I described in the video. You might have seen me click right through it. These data were collected upstairs in our rat lab a few, I guess almost 10 years ago. Uh, I was the second reader on Mandy Calkin's senior research project. Dr. Susan Kennedy is our, one of our neuroscientists and one of our pharmacologists. She did some really interesting work with 
uh, how it is that our response to different kinds of psychoactive drugs uh, depends on our early exposure to them. If you get exposed to the drugs early in life and if you have a lot of stress in your life, does that increase your sensitivity to something like cocaine or does it have no effect on your, your sensitivity to cocaine? Okay, so what we, we're doing in, uh, in this particular study is we have rats that are running around this maze and we have ways of measuring how far they're running, how fast they're running, how frequently they rear themselves. They call that vertical activity. Okay? It's, a, it's a measure of maybe hyperactivity. The more you're vertically rearing, uh, the more hyperactive you are. Okay? So let's take a look at this and let's just have you do some mental gymnastics on this and maybe we'll ask this question. Do we think there's a significant three-way interaction in this data set? If you think there's a significant three-way interaction, please signify by holding up one finger. If you think there's a non-significant three-way interaction, hold up two fingers. If you're not sure what's going on here, we'll hold up three fingers. So we're looking at the three-way interaction. Okay, see lots of threes, which is perfectly reasonable. Lots of folks are not sure what to do with this three-way. Mira and Jenna are voting, and Marin are all voting one. Let's, let's, see, let's check in. I think I saw Mira first. So can you help us through and see what you've got? Um, well, since the right graph is very similar. Okay. And then the left graph is Okay, can you just tell us in what way are they? So in the right graph, I think I know what you mean when you say they're very similar. And I think I agree, but can we just make that really explicit? What is similar in this case? There's no, I think you're correct in saying there's no interaction, and can you just remind us how you got there? Um, because the columns are almost even. The columns are almost even. I think I'm with you. Can we, I wonder if we just need a little bit more. Maureen, can you help us out? I, I think she's got the right idea. Well, I just did the same thing we were doing when there was only uh, two. Yeah, good. Good. Okay. Okay, and they're parallel. Who's okay with this? If we go blue to blue, we've got maybe even, it's almost a 60 degree angle down. Who's okay with that? We'll call it 60-ish degrees. And if we go red to red, it's about the same angle down. It might not be exactly the same, but pretty close. Who's okay that we're gonna wind up generating parallel lines down over here? Is that working for us? Okay, so pretty big no on the two-way interaction on this level of this variable. This is something like day two, this is day one, so we have some kind of time variable as our third variable. And day two, we're not getting an interaction. Who's comfortable with that? Yeah. So a big zero over on this side for the interaction. Now we go over to this side and we look at the steepness of the lines. We connect blue to blue, really, really steep down, and then red to red, it's going down but not nearly so steeply. So we probably have crisscrossing lines here, okay? Although it's not as the strongest case we've ever seen, we probably have crisscrossing lines here. Pretty good evidence for an interaction here. Absolutely no evidence for an interaction here. Who's okay with that? Does that work for us? So what does that tell us about the three-way interaction? We've got one, okay, because we've got a three-way interaction whenever we have different two-way interactions at the various levels of the third variable. Just to remind you, we had the same thing over here. No interaction, big interaction. Okay, we go over to here, and we have no interaction, pretty big interaction. <laughs> Could be bigger, but it's a pretty big interaction. So we wind up with a three-way interaction over on this side. What I love about three-way interactions is they give us a better model of the real world, the other thing I like about them is once you get good at these, doing regular two-way interactions becomes really, really easy. It's kind of like swinging a bat with a donut on it. If you can do that in a three-way, then coming back to a simple two-way is going to be really quite easy for us. Okay. Questions or comments on any of that? Yeah, please. So the way you determine three-way interaction is if each of the two-way interactions have different amounts yeah. of interaction. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So if that's right, so we have to look at this one all by itself and hang on to that just for a moment. Look at this interaction all by itself and hang on to that and then compare those two interactions for each other. If this one's null and that one's null, then those two interactions are similar and we don't have ev any evidence for a three-way interaction. But if this one is generating a lot of evidence for an interaction and this one is none, then we have evidence for a three-way. Okay? It's almost like having a moment ago different differences. Okay, remember that we had different differences were ways of establishing that we had a two-way interaction. Now we don't have different differences, but we have different two-ways. Okay? Takes a little bit of practice. It's, it's difficult. Please go ahead. Could they, uh, like, would it be a three-way interaction if they were both um, generating interactions? Okay, very interesting point. 
and this gets a little bit complicated, but let's say that we had this pattern, okay? And then we have that pattern again right over here. Big, big two-way interaction and an equally big two-way interaction. That would be no evidence for a three-way interaction. They have to be different from each other, okay? Does that work? Yeah, they have to be different from each other. Okay, well that's one of the subtlest points. Okay, now we get to go back to the two-way. <laughs> that's about as high as we fly. Uh, we're not going to do four ways. We're not going to do five ways. The real environment out there, there might be a hundred variables. Okay, we saw the complexity of what, what arises once you start getting into um, even three ways. So you have the three-way interaction. You have a family of two-way interactions, right? The A by B, and then separately the B by C, and separately the C by A. Okay, it gets complicated very quickly, and that was only three, and we only had two levels of each of those variables. You can see how complicated the real world must be. But at least we have a way to begin to think about that complexity using factorial designs. So we'll return now to the A by B. Can we all go, Phew. let's all do that? <laughs> okay, all right, so now we're back to something not so uh, difficult. Can somebody yell out the dimensionality of this one? What's the dimensionality of this graph? 3 by 2, KDB's got it, okay? We have three levels of the amount of practice, and we have two levels of, we'll call it exercise difficulty. Some of the exercises are easy, some of the exercises are hard, and we're measuring something like the percent of exercises that are completed here, okay? Um, first, do we have an interaction here? Yes or no? Let's yell it out. We do have an interaction because we have a departure from parallelism, right? So these are not parallel. So why is this maybe bogus or a misleading bit? Somebody help us out with that. Thank you, Jenna. That's the ceiling and that's the floor, floor ceiling and floor effect, okay, right? Uh -huh. So this will happen if there's, um, if there's maybe exercises that are extremely easy. Yeah. That can do that's right. So it looks like at least these easy exercises are so easy that even at the 30 minutes of practice, we're already acing them and we can't get any higher. So we can now, after we're that high, we can practice for another 30 minutes. That brings us up to 60 minutes of practice, but it doesn't really buy us anything because it can't. We're already at 100% correct. We can't do better than that. So we're on the ceiling, okay? Um, an example of a ceiling test might be something like this. Imagine that you were all in 12th grade not that many years ago, and we gave you something like fifth grade math problems when you were in 12th grade. We'd have a ceiling effect there for those fifth grade math because you would be nailing those. Who's okay with that? That's a ceiling effect, okay? Um, let's take those fifth grade problems again, but now we give them to first graders. I'm not going to do so well. Right? First graders, generally speaking, can't do fifth grade math. Maybe some of you could, but generally speaking, first graders couldn't do fifth grade math, and they would be on the floor. Right? So we could have lots and lots of practice in that day for either 30 minutes or 50 minutes, but first graders really are not going to be able to do fifth grade math after 60 minutes worth of practice. Okay? And probably 12th graders are not going to get any better <laughs> uh, than they already were after 60 minutes of practice. Okay? So what we can say here is, yes, we do have an interaction, but it's a little bit misleading because we have the ceiling effect. Right? We ran out of uh, an opportunity to improve, so maybe that line could have kept going, but the reason it stopped is just because we ran out of range on our y-axis variable. Who's following that? Okay? All right. All right. Real good. All right, let's see if we can go on and do just a little bit more. Um, we'll see if we can understand something about this. So these data are just made up. Sometimes people freak out when uh, they, they don't know that these data are just made up. But here we're looking at the probability of finding a spouse. Okay? And uh, I just made these up for illustrative purposes. And we're looking at males versus females. So in this graph, the probability of finding a spouse is plotted as a function of gender with the age of the respondent as the parameter. Okay? It's a two by two. All right? Um, here it can be misleading to say that there is no main effect of gender. Uh, and this is making the point that the interaction can obscure a main effect. Strictly speaking, there is no main effect here, right? Because if we look at uh, the, the average of males would be right about here. The average of females would be right about that same level. So there would be no main effect, and, and that's true. It's a little bit misleading because very different things are happening for males and females, right? If we look at what's going on here, when we go from young to old, we're going from red to blue. And that means that for males, the probability of finding a spouse is going up as they're getting older. And for females, the probability is going in the opposite direction. So it is mathematically true that there's no effect for gender, but it can be a little bit misleading, right? Because the two genders, at least according to this graph, are having very different experiences over time. Who's following that? That worked for us? Okay. Then we've got one more. Okay. Can somebody remind us what's wrong with this graph? I do this in the video. We'll end on this one. 
Okay, thank you, Mira. Okay. Okay, it should be a bar graph because... Okay, because the x-axis is categorical, right? So we somehow we're trying to connect uh, across here with these blue lines. That's a little bit misleading, right? We wouldn't, we wouldn't want to do that. Typically, if we have a categorical x variable, then we typically prefer to have a bar graph. Giselle, I think, also had her hand up. Was that what you were going to say? Okay. So, yeah, if we have a categorical variable here on the x-axis, we typically go with bar graphs rather than line graphs. Line graphs are wonderful if you have a continuous x-axis variable. They can show you the trend. Okay. All right. That was a great exercise. We didn't get to today's stuff, but that's all right because we don't have a new PowerPoint for tonight. So if you didn't get to watch yesterday's video for today, um, then you, you lucked out. So please make sure that you watch the 11-12 video, and that will take us through something called simple effects and also the hypotheses for factorial designs. Thanks for a great conversation. See you tomorrow. There, there isn't a new one, there, and there's no new one, so the one that we had for today, you can watch again, or if you hadn't watched it, you got lucky, okay? Okay, thank you.